Welcome to the integral stage. A great deal of our thinking is born on the back of metaphor. It gives body to our philosophies and guides our practices. And we can often crack open our thinking. We can release creative energy and liberate startling new insights just by examining the metaphors implicit in our models and trying out new ones. In today's video, I'm debuting a new series I'm calling Integral Stage Mind Walks, which will feature deep diving and wide ranging discussions on select topics for those of you who like to explore and test the edges of your thinking. For our first mind walk, Lehman Pascal and Tom Murray reflect deeply on our metaphors of development, starting with Tom Murray's brilliant and pristine writings on adult development, and then following the mad falconer, Lehman Pascal, in widening gyres to consider some alternative metaphorical framings that might yield additional insight. I don't take part in this conversation, but together with you, I do listen in, which is why you'll see my cheery profile haunting the edges of this discussion. I hope you enjoy it. I've been uh, listening to your article for the Meta Modern Reader. This is my editing <laughs> As I run it through this app and then put it on my MP3 player, then listen to the chapters. Like, really? Yeah. Oh, what, what's the app? It's called Balabolka. It's a, like a I Russian said. app, but it's really fast. It's very effective. Yeah. So your, uh, your article, the first half hour of walking and listening, I was like, wow. <laughs> I thought this is amazingly comprehensive and succinct. Like I was, I was envious really? of how well packaged it was. What do you mean? <laughs> I started to get agitated because there was like something was bugging me about a blade of additive complexity simplicity. Yeah. And it's not something that I think is wrong with the chapter, like because it's it's a total useful way to look at it. I'm just yeah. curious about what's prickling me on this topic. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's a couple different approaches, like uh one approach I think of as complementarity, like uh, sometimes additive, sometimes ablative. Sometimes there isn't enough complexity. Sometimes there's too much complexity. That seems good. Then there's like a monistic approach where you go, actually, everything that seems ablative is another form of additive. And it would be more precise to technically describe it all as variations of one thing. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> and then there's uh -huh. something like... Uh, <laughs> like feng shui, like it's, it's not more or less complex. The, the actual shift is just the arrangement of the items. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. That's something that I would think of as Nietzschean where you go, well, one form of complexity is good and one form is bad and one form of simplicity is good and one form of simplicity is bad. You got to cut them open. So those are like my four approaches and I, I'm just totally undecided. I don't even know if I have to decide, but I think that's where the action is. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what I'm, I don't know how far you've gotten into it, and I've written more since then. Um, that was like a, a draft. Um, surprised that it read well, at least part of it. It's good. Um, but I would say what you call the Nietzschean is, is, is actually exactly what i'm i'm heading for yeah there's there's good simplicity simplicity and bad simplicity and good complexity and bad complexity and it's all and it's all just a question of what's working what's working it's a very it's a very um pragmatist kind of bottom line it's and and also it the the model is that um well, I'll try to say, you know, what we, if other people are going to listen to this, we should, I should start maybe by summarizing what we're talking about. Yeah, that's which, great. Let's see if I can get on the elevator and make an elevator speech out of it. But it's, um, it's an approach to looking at, at it's a, an approach to puzzling out some, uh, what seem to be confusions in conversations around human development where some of them seem to be very much about complexity, things like taking multiple perspectives and taking a systems approach and um, turning subject into object. And, you know, all of those things are building complexity as we talk about in the developmental um, 
conversation, including the integral, integral theory, um, anything that's got the, the dynamic of differentiating and integrating through, ver through layers and layers of that is building complexity. And <clears throat> there's this kind of puzzle where at the top, at the sort of higher levels of things, things seem to get simpler. All come together, you know, in some telos or omega point or something like that. Um, and yet the actual dynamics of, of you know, the, the people in the um, neo Piagetian and hierarchical complexity tradition have done a really nice job of of mapping out exactly what complexity is and um, and also people who study evolution um, have a similar narrative which shows that as you increase in complexity um, through those mechanisms um, you increase diversity and uniqueness and things don't come together into some unity or wholeness um, uh, to total wholeness <clears throat> so so there's a so there's this a counter narrative that has to do with uh, uh, emptying out and letting go and non you know this the non dual conversation and all that and so what this model is proposing is that any conversation needs to talk about both um, um, com complexity which is additive but also simplicity which is about um, what I use the word ablation. Um, which they get from Baskar's work, which is has is it's really many different metaphors that are possible here, and it's kind of a family of metaphors: um, removing, healing, subtracting. This is shadow work is involved in this. Um, seeing through, um, going back to foundations or basics, and so forth. So, and. So now I'm catching up to what I was about to say, which is the, the model is that every time we build complexity, we do it for some re reason, some supposedly good reason, just like when the child is abused and they learn something, which later becomes a shadow material in their psyche. But when they learn it, it's for a good reason. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, um, it's it's a structure of neural connections, a learning that is there for a reason. And we can say that's the case for everything that we learn, which is and learning is essentially increasing complexity in that sense. But then uh, ultimately with certain things, you reach a point when you realize that that thing that you learned is no longer uh, useful to your life, your context, your goals, um, who you who you are, who you consider yourself to be. And um, so then we go into things like shadow work or contemplative practice that um, goes back in and cleans out the prior levels. And so, as you said, some complexity is good and some is not useful anymore. Uh, and some is useful. And some simplicity is uh, good and some is uh, well, there's two senses of when simplicity is not good. One is, is when it's kind of like idiot compassion or when you drop too much and you're not, you don't have enough complexity to deal with the situation at hand. Um, and the other is if you reduce complexity too quickly. So like the person who uh, deconstructs the, the, their ego before they have an ego is in trouble the person who performs uh, some meditation technique that deconstructs time and space for them before they're ready for that is getting in trouble so so that's yes that's a very a reasonable and very balanced sounding approach okay yeah uh, but it's got a bunch of openings <laughs> in it that intrigue me right? right one of the openings is a question like is there really a difference between uh, developmental growth and healing? You know, and when a person unlearns, is that really a simplification or is that an increase of complexity? Or when yeah. they deconstruct something, is that thing being removed or let go or winnowed down? Or is it actually being opened up and new things are being installed into the cracks or it's being uh, a, a new interpretive frame is being added on top, you know? 
Uh, to what degree is yeah. to what degree is unlearning and ablation in that sense anything more than a useful poetic metaphor for that people can relate to? Is, is it actually a, a good ontological description? Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it brings up a couple of things. One is um, one of the books, one of the chapters in the book uh, is going to tie brain theory into all of this. And um, so I'm, you know, looking at the, it's mostly right now um, uh, cognitive and brain theories of trauma that are related to this. Um, um, and, it, you know, it, it looks like um, neural connections don't sort of get severed or scrubbed away, um, but rather they get sort of rerouted. So you could say, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, like in denial of the fact that you have a body, or let's say a, a, a sexual nature. And that's because there's, that's because one of the connections, just because there are connections that are inhibitory. So of all these connections that happen when we're learning, some are excitatory and some are inhibitory. So some say, don't go there. So there's something that says, don't go there around your sexuality, some shadow piece. And so, so the question is, okay, what's the healing process that opens you up to your fuller self? And I think you're right at the, at the um, biophysical level, it's probably not that that inhibitory connection gets like erased somehow. It's that either it gets routed around, so you have another access to the thing that you're, that you're um, uh, unaware of or not accessing, or perhaps the, the inhibitory link gets an inhibition itself. So you're inhibiting the inhibitory link. So both of those are new links, whether it's a route around or an inhibition of the inhibition, and in that sense, yes, it's it, it's additional learning. Um, so I I think you're right there, but I but there's also something about the phenomenology of the stuff I'm talking about, and to use Bonnie's term, releasing complexity. There's something important about the phenomenology of all these different ways of releasing yeah. complexity that really do feel like you're releasing yeah the the connection that's the attached the attachment to it or something as you know my model of spiritual development um has a number of diverse trajectories based on trying to create a surplus harmony out of different subjective sub functions and so i have this saying right that you can create this kind of functional parity it creates a numinous excess so then you can enter into some kind of relationship with that numinous excess and if you do it like that, you can cover all the phenomenology and cut most of the metaphysics out. So it's tied yeah, that way. However, yeah. can you? But can you? Can you just um, back up and <laughs> okay? Just go ahead and give 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 the slightly longer version of that. Well, um, put you on the spot for your elevator. Speed. There are there are a variety of subjectively active subfunctions in an individual. Right. And in integral theory, we have a way of talking about those you, lines are one of those right? you have an intellectual intelligence an emotional intelligence, a somatic intelligence. They are intelligences insofar as you have some kind of subjective inhabitation of those skill sets. Uh, you also have a right brain and a left brain. You also have an awareness of self and an awareness of other. These are relatively discrete uh, modules. Uh, of subjective intelligence, right? You have your awareness of your inside and your awareness of your outside. So there's all these partitions, however dramatic or permeable they are. And yep. my impression is that at least most, maybe all, functional spiritual practices involve running multiple systems in relative parity so that they balance, there's a rough harmonization. And this harmonization creates an effect, um, an additional resonance, an overtone between these frequencies. 
a, a phenomenon, a field-like phenomenon that's greater than the sum of the parts. And so what you experience is an additional quality of subjectively available coherence that's related to your identity, but not necessarily confined to your identity. It exceeds your functions, but is intimately related to them. It organizes everything around you, so things seem super meaningful and super coordinated in your peak moments because of this additional coherence that is more than you need for your ordinary functions. And you can enter into a relationship with this. It can be your halo, it could be your deity, it could be a sense of self. You could do it through any of the integral lenses, right? It could be a self, it could be an energy, it could be an other, however you want to interpret that. And then your spiritual life practice in a way is exercises that create that and then things you do on the basis of that, trying to assimilate it, trying to let it guide you. Um, and then the tidy thing about it again is uh, you can run that to the sociological dimension and say that the same process is what religion is, except in religion, instead of individual subjective subfunctions, we're dealing with um, cultural functions or genres of society. And when they're brought together in relative parity, they create this additional interpersonal rather than intrapersonal version of the same phenomenon, which is why there's such a similarity between religion and spirituality. Can I ask a question here, or yeah. should you? Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to get on too much of a tangent, but one thing that uh, occurs to me in that is you're starting from the place where these subfunctions, and, and when you talk about the subfunctions, they, they seem to come in either pairs or polar opposites or, or, or some coordinated group of sure, things. Sets that, of them that, somehow, yeah. Yeah, and the sets are, um, yeah, the sets sort of form some kind of coherent whole. They, you know, like subjective and objective, they, they create. Yeah, the, the, and I don't know how much that's just convenient and how much that's really, you yeah. know, psychological well, anatomy. Right. That's my question is, um, where do those, you kind of start from the splits and then you say, um, if you can achieve some kind of first uh, dialogue between them and then sort of coherence and eventually kind of this numinous interpenetration, then you get, you know, kind of you've, uh, yeah, a, a, a new whole emerges. But you kind of start with the split and I'm wondering about before that, what, what creates the split? So in some cases, like yeah. with, um, let's say, with, uh, with sexuality or gender, there's a biological forcing function. So nature creates the split mm -hmm. um, in some senses. Of course, there are other, other ways which we um, culturally do all kinds of other things to create splits there. But... But with, with uh, other things, it seems like the split is something that is created in the psyche. And so when you take something that's naturally whole, and this may, ha this may, this may actually um, cover even the biological cases um, or those that exist more naturally in nature. When you take something that's naturally whole and you split it, you create a tension. And so, um, and a kind of demi-reality, um, a, a rupture in a sense. Um, and maybe it's a maybe it's a productive tension. But then, so then you're saying, and then your story says when you put them back together, you get this release and this different phenomena. But I'm wondering about you know, right? Like, it is, could is go a couple people? different ways there, um, because it's undecided whether there's an original whole, I think, right? One, one way of looking at it is you start whole and then a split means that there was a splitting, which is a reasonable thing because we do undergo traumas, we do make decisions, we see branching phenomenon in nature, we see bifurcations. The other model is um, what you're doing is a bunch of different things are trying to come together and to create a whole, which is the more the developmental stacking model, right? So that your 
looks yeah. like you're an organism, but are you? Right, you're a, an ensemble right. of cells and organs and bacterial colonies and these things. And there's a variable degree to which those things actually harmonize together to make you. And that that is an ongoing work. You don't get to just one off your unity. Uh, yeah. Everybody who wakes up in the morning has to put themselves back together somehow. And so yeah. there's this uh, constant yeah. creative effort to bring together these things. And if we don't do the work of bringing them together, they may go their separate ways. And it may be that what we think of as uh, a traumatic or undeveloped rupture or split within a person is a sign that the creative effort of putting themselves back together is insufficient in that case, rather than a sign that an unusual splitting has occurred. It may be very yeah. normal to constantly have to do it. That might be yeah. the feeling of normal. Yeah. So given that that's my position, okay, I then have to explain to myself somehow why it is that I do so many practices that phenomenologically seem to be release. Right. Can you so, say, you, there was a there was a glitch in the. Okay. In the I do a there. lot of practices that I yeah. I even label to myself as release like practices. Yeah. Yes. And so I have to figure out a way to phrase that as if it's um, this numinous excess coherence production for them to jive. I either have to say there's two processes or I have to be able to figure out how to describe the one as the other because I do a lot of both. Now, maybe that's maybe I'm doing a lot of the same and it just looks different, uh, but it's something that I need to. The self-consistency of my position demands that I explain my own release practices yeah. somehow in accordance with this other model. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd say I, now, now I see where my 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 question about your model actually came from trying to you know coordinate it with my with mine. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that um, the part of my model that sounds like yours is and and this is something else i get from bonnie is um yeah every time you learn something you make a connection and in a sense you're kind of binding energy there and depending on the kind of connection is if it's you know if it's if it's created along with a, a sense of fear or urgency or trauma there's a certain uh, there's a certain quality of energy that's bound up there, but also if you just are attached to that that learning that idea or that skill because a lot of things are built on top of it that kind of almost the weight of everything creates a kind of structural uh, energy that's bound up there, so that when you do an ablative move which metaphorically releases that um there's a uh there's a, a release of insight and energy and, it, and it's you know very similar to the i like the word numinous excess that you um that you use um so that's kind of yeah that's kind of the part of my thing that sounds similar so yeah. so so there's a yeah yeah so so unlearning creates insight and it's not only you know the the example i like to give is let's say um uh i have an issue with the women in my life because i had some problem with my mother growing up except i don't know that so i keep blaming it on the women and why are women so re so stupid or whatever they are clingy or whatever they are and then I go to a therapy session or I'm doing meditation or whatever. And I, I have, and the thing, the, the, the thing that in my mind that connects women with clinginess um, deconstructs or ablates or loosens or is seen through. So that's the first move is right. the thing that was learned is ablated. Right. And then all of a sudden, from that freedom, everything that's built on top of it starts wiggling and reconfiguring, and I have all these this, these insights and this energy. These, you know, I might feel it as a chill up my spine. It's like, oh my god! And I, 
suddenly understand my mother better and suddenly I'm realizing I'm blaming all the women in my life and blah, 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 blah. So that's kind of this, that's what the model, I, it's, big release. That's an interesting moment. You know, phenomenologically, that's very relatable. And then descriptively, you know, am I unbinding something or am I adding a distinction? Am I, am I generating complexity by teasing these things apart? And now I've made it more complicated because I have multiple things where one thing was, and those multiple things can be arranged in a bigger organizational frame. So that's one way to look at it. However, this sense of undoing and this sense of unbinding an energy, that's a very visceral experience. Um, and so I don't want to, I don't want to downplay that, but I also don't want to be seductively persuaded by it just because that's how it seems to me as a human. Right, right. It's a, it's an interesting place where um, these metaphors are running out of steam, and and it's kind of like particle wave sense that what the thing really is is sort of like the undoing and the unbinding, and it's sort of like the teasing apart and creating a, a new a new thing, like you're saying. So I think we're kind of in agreement that it's something that's not as simple as either of those metaphors. Yeah, it might be that, you know, complexity and simplicity isn't really the right way to talk about this. That that's, it's a very good way. It's better than a lot of ways. But it might still be a screen on a subtler distinction. <laughs> it has to be correct, at least until I finish the book. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Don't, don't hold back on the book. I like it. <laughs> i'm standing by that <laughs> yeah i think you should but I, i'm trying uh, to kick around any alternatives that might be out there yeah no good the uh that's good it's good if it's good if a book if the last chapter of a book um looks looks towards the limitations and and what could be next so we've got to have that in there <laughs> <laughs> um If things so, yeah. are simplistic, right? So a bad simplicity multiplied may become a, a complication that's distinct from a complexity. So it might be that things that the bad complexity, which I might also call complicated rather than complex, um, it might be that that's a result of a, an array of things that are too simple. Right, like it's a simple, it could be a simplicity pushed too far or too many simplicities. Uh, and that might be its own distinct trajectory. It might lead toward complicated instead of leading toward complexity in the sense of being simplex, uh, an integrated complexity. It might be different right. trajectories there. Yes, okay. This brings us into territory that I'm trying to tease out now. And I actually wanted to talk to you about this, but I. I was waiting until I, I had a better sense of what the question is, but here we are. So the wait is over and let's see if I can do this. So there's, so what I've been chewing on is, um, so the, 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 the concept of abstraction is very tied up in this developmental movement of complexity. Um, and so, well, so first of all, what I, um, you can tell me if I do a good job of this in the text or not. I, I try to make a, a, a distinction between, so there's the part of the mind that is, works through language and symbols and categories. Um, and it's mostly sort of the conscious mind, meaning making in terms of all that we do with you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with creating splits and categories. And we all know that there's problems with that. Every time we create a category where, you know, it's a split that does some useful function, but it also creates some problems. Um, then <clears throat> there's the unconscious or the rest of the mind, which isn't, tr which is dealing more in, you know, fluid, flexible, um, 
it's not trying to create things in, it's not trying to use strict categories because it's not using language. So if that has a kind of complexity that's more nature-like, more organic, um, as compared to the kind of complexity that we create with language and thought and theories and ideas and bureaucracies and everything that comes out of the sort of conscious, um, yeah, that sort of conscious symbolic side of the mind. So, so the, 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 you know, one of the goals of all this in the idea of, reducing complexity when that's useful is that usually you can't reduce complexity in in the organic nature it just is you can manage it you can futz around with that but you can't just reduce complexity that's in nature and that includes the complexity outside of nature and also the complexity of your own unconscious it's just there and it's very complex but we build all these complex ideas and theories and systems and bureaucracies and rules and laws and um, organizational procedures and all of that that uh, could are arguably too complex. And so that's the domain of reducing complexity or at least evaluating whether we, we want to reduce complexity. Um, and so in that domain, abstraction plays an important role. And so let me pause for a second and say, the theme of this question is the phrase, the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And how I think that is often misunderstood or misused. Okay, so back to what I was saying. If you there's this idea that, yeah, so abstract, what abstraction does is it sees what's in common between two things and it creates a new thing. And in doing so, it throws out lots of detail and it just says, you know, all these things that you're looking at are trees. And they, again, and the tree has, is de defined by these five things. So suddenly you have a category called tree, it's an abstraction over reality, and you've thrown out a lot of detail and nuance. And now you have this tool called tree, which is gonna be useful, but it's also gonna get you in trouble because now you're seeing things as trees instead of what they actually are. So you've created a simplicity on the other side, so to speak, of that complexity with, abstract, with the tool of abstraction the cognitive method of abstraction but it's a simplicity gained at a price and so if you're if you're uh, you know uh, the modern mind loves abstraction and loves you know this kind of move but um and it doesn't see the problems often doesn't see the problems created in that kind of move so so there's different kinds of simplicities on the other sides of complexity. One is that nature naturally brings things together um, in ways where the parts organize into a whole on and a new simplicity and actually usually often releases energy because there's a more efficient coordination of functioning in the whole. And then there's this kind of simplicity I was just talking about, which is kind of a conceptual or forced simplicity, which actually creates demi-reality. Then there's a different kind of simplicity, another one that's theoretical and cognitive, but it's, it's about discovering foundational or fundamental principles. So instead of sort of going up in abstraction, you're going down and looking for what is it that can explain and account for what we see at this level. Um, and the thing about that move is that it, like the move up often makes it sound like you know something and you can tie it in a bow and you, the world is simpler. The move down, it's like you've discovered something about the source code 
or the fundamental laws. And so you really have a deep understanding, but what those fundamental laws create is, is chaos. It's like, it's like there's all these rules and they're operating together, but you can't use it to predict some simple thing that's gonna come out. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense there, but it, it doesn't lead you to this place of overconfidence um, that the abstraction does. It's more like, oh, we understand some of the fundamental mechanisms, but you know, it's like the three body problem. It's like we understand the laws of physics down there, but we can't tell you where those three bodies are. And we don't, we're not gonna have the answer at all times. Okay, well, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let me the, see. The first thing uh, I want to touch on is the conscious unconscious thing, because that's a big part of my looking. Uh, and it does seem to me that in general, there's something like a, a subconscious agency that is the primary cognitive and developmental character of which the conscious personality is either an assistance or an obstruction in most cases. And out of the exaggeration uh, of the subfunction of the mind, which we call consciousness, comes an exaggeration of the entire abstract socio-technological modeling realm. It gets too much credit. It's not really the perceiver, the comprehender, the motivational agent. It's not really who does the developing. It's a sidekick. So there's that. Yeah. And also I think one of the one of the odd things about ablative methods is that if the consciousness steps back or plugs in properly to its role rather than trying to do all the work itself, it can seem like it's been released. Even though it might still be doing just as much work. It might not have decreased. It just might be in its spot now. It might be on its own mat, so to speak. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So that's that's going in my mind. But these other these types of abstraction and complexity you mentioned, I don't know. And this is sort of the overall topic: how different the up and the down are in that description. It might be that what you first called up, like a higher level of abstraction, might not actually be higher. It might still be on a flat plane might just it might be a rather horizontal move that just makes it more complicated and in the integral sense of altitude it might be that the actual higher and deeper are kind of the same move right and that uh the very same kinds of abstraction that initially appeared to uh create some problematic overgeneralizations which lost a lot of the natural detail those processes may have just continued to go further and further in that same direction and in doing so noticed they were lacking detail um, created unfolding complex fractal algorithms and things like that which come to that second point because there is a a very in some ways straightforward abstract relationship between processes that are extremely simple and processes that exceed our ability to predict or comprehend. Uh, and you know, when I think of simplexity, I think of this pairing. I don't know how to do it here like this. Because <laughs> uh -huh. it's not just that a whole bunch of things can be brought together into a new whole. It's also that a very simple computational formula can run the exact same way and produce a sequence that is impossible to shortcut there's no right. linear compression of that sequence and so you stand before it as you are stand before the three body problem you confront right. the limit of not only your uh cognitive comprehension but in all probability you stand before the limit of any complex system contemplating any other complex system right um, it comes down right. It, it comes down to just the chaos theory and the butterfly effect and all of that. It's you, you, it's yeah. um it's a it's like a <clears throat> yeah. There's kind of like a kind of simplicity in the in the causal depth 
but a complexity in the surface manifestation that's unavoidable or something like that yeah and that's crucial to i mean it's it's humbling but it also increases our accuracy uh i mean one of the things when i hear simplicity i'm not sure i'm hearing simplicity maybe i am maybe i'm not but i might also be hearing naturalization something that feels natural and natural seems to me to be a kind of product of a higher fidelity mapping between the nervous system and nature nature has this ontological complexity and it has all these various styles and processes that she uses uh, and we often don't map it with very much texture and detail and so the degree to which we can uh, cooperate with nature's ontological complexity seems to me the degree to which we co-generate the experience that we call natural and right it might be might feel like simple might feel like flow might feel like the appropriate design processes for structures whatever that is it's a co-creation with us but i think it only right. works in the degree to which our social models our abstract models uh, approach nature's actual forms with greater fidelity yeah yeah great yeah it seems like there's two versions of that one is the what we might call the embodied unconscious version which is where the yeah the natural structures <clears throat> of the mind and understanding and perception as you said are uh have a high, high fidelity or match i mean they're 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 each sub function is tuned to pick up certain kinds of patterns and not other kinds so when the thing in nature that you want to or need to understand uh has those kind of patterns then there's that feeling of simplicity and when it doesn't it feels complex or or just it maybe it's invisible <clears throat> um and then the other level is just at the that symbolic language conscious level where it's just like oh i found an example that fits my model or i just made the world fit my model how, that how nice that feels <clears throat> yeah yeah that's weird that's uh i mean there's some validity to that experience and yet it's it's treacherous uh because yeah. it almost looks like the reverse of creating a high fidelity model <laughs> right exactly yeah and, and one interesting question is at the phenomenological level do those two experiences actually feel the same is, the, is that feeling of oh great i i get it or i'm flowing with it is there is there a phenomenological difference do you, can can you know based on a feeling sense i suspect you can uh, in the sense that the one would be more extended, diverse, and richer. Like, in my mind, one of them feels more spread out. The other one feels like maybe it has an element, a valid element that is the same as the other one, but it's a much smaller valid element. So there's like a little spark and like an area around the spark that's being treated as if it was the spark, too. And the other one, there's a whole bunch of sparks. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, I'm. I would guess that you're right. That they, if you're turn, tuned into it, you can tell they feel different. Yeah, because in one, there's there's more like a flow state, which is kind of like the whole being is in a in a resonant receptivity with with whatever's whatever the input is and that's kind of a full body kind of experience and it's also more of a uh yeah it's more expansive than sort of focusing contractive whereas the other is more like oh i've just put things into a tidy box and so when you do that the mind is ignoring things so it must feel there must be a feeling 
yeah. that goes along. There's the good feeling that it's in a box and you've just ignored a lot of stuff, but the, there must also be a phenomenological um, aspect to the fact that you're, you're holding, you're constraining. It's not a flow in that sense. Yeah, and I, I mean, people must differ in their ability to make that felt distinction. Yes. Um, it also seems like it's something that could be trained, like right. maybe the Zen parables are tales of people in a training mm -hmm. system trying to make that very distinction. Yeah. On the other hand, some people could be born, you know, with a weird nervous system, you know, that they just can't do it. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to leave out the, you know, you don't want to sacrifice the actual neurodiversity of the world. Some people are born without a conscience. Some people lack <laughs> prosody or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> They're not necessarily failures. They might just be yep. specially adapted for some other purpose. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I think a lot of the motivation towards affirming the role that simplicity has to play comes from the desire to have that experience and is the confession of people who don't necessarily get that experience when they confront what other people refer to as complexity. You know, if you go into a country and say, look, we have an upgraded system. It takes more things into account. It's going to get the job done. And you don't know for sure whether that's truth or not. But you do know if you don't get the feeling and you check it out, you interact with it, the interfaces seem unnatural, you don't get a sense of how it ties together, you're not invited to immediate participation yourself, you don't get to have the sense uh, of what's really going on for yourself, so you don't get the sparks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you develop a, an ongoing, an accumulated critique of complex things because so many times people have told you something complex and you never got the feeling. Maybe right. complex is flawed then, as far as you're concerned. Right, and that seems to be a kind of a, 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 an outgrowth of, in some sense, the abstraction move. Um, because whenever you, whenever you have an idea that seems like it's a solution, but you're disconnected from, you know, to say we could say the realities of the stakeholders. It's just this shiny thing in your mind. It's the silver bullet, and um, that has a kind of demi-real simplicity to it. And yeah, well, in some cases, it's more more uh, more a matter of ignorance than that you're actually in denial of anything because it takes some time for designers to learn that mm. their minds don't simulate other people's minds and experiences you have to go out there and participate yeah with stakeholders to to find out what works yeah if you're as your complexity expands um and which i mean when i try to write complexity on my own two axis developmental charts I end up meaning something like an expanding range of types of patterns that can be recognized. Yeah. Um, and those are the types of patterns out of which you can abstract common features. So as you make some stage progression, you should be able to uh, incorporate abstractions that deal with things from multiple dimensions better. Right? Like if you never, if you never run into certain kinds of perspectives, then you never have the chance to abstract from those and add them to your previous abstractions. So you end up with an impoverished looking abstraction. Uh -huh. um, you know, one of the things that strikes me as interesting is legislation. And it seems to me that there's a recurring, at least nominally conservative move, which says, there's too many laws. We got to dial it back. Even Trump said he was going to only allow one new law if two of them were removed at the same time. I don't think that's what he's actually doing, but it's an interesting <laughs> pledge. I, I can get behind the principle. 
which is yeah. there are too many. It's too complicated. It's dehumanizing. The legal system feels unnatural to the average person who doesn't want to have to interface with it through a mediating agent. Right. Um, but there are lots of laws that probably could be abstracted under a common principle. Right. So that uh, like up here, we decriminalized marijuana. It's for sale everywhere up here now. Um, but there's a question about how are the police going to deal with it, right? Because we have laws about alcohol and driving. So now we get some laws about cannabis and driving, right? And you can go down the line. Each substance can have its own laws, which require its own litigators. But in reality, you would think that a, a rule concerning intoxicated dysfunction would cover anything, would cover sleep deprivation, would cover legal medication, would cover whatever it is. So it would be simple, it's abstracted, it's flexible, it can create all these other instances on the ground, uh, but it, it folds in a whole bunch of other experiences that aren't in the usual legal abstraction. It folds in even many critiques of the current system. Um, yeah, <laughs> that kind of brings up, brings me back to kind of the, the, one of the conundrums of this question I was asking because the the, the 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 question was like contrasting this abstraction move which throws things away from the the which kind of goes up developmentally yeah. and throws things away from the move to look for foundational patterns or source code which is kind of a move down now both of them in both of them you end up with something that has less parameters you know less moving parts mm -hmm. and it seems simpler the question is, can you, can you tell when you're doing one move or another? Can, can, can you fool yourself into thinking? Because this is, what, this is what all philosophers do and some scientists and a lot of sociologists. People that create models, they think there's finding fundamental principles that underlie everything. But sometimes what they're doing is they're actually making an abstraction that doesn't capture real fundamental principles. It just feels, it's just a theory. It feels like it explains. So, so the question is whether you can actually tell without, if, if there are pr inherent properties that, that um, reveal yeah. which direction you're going and, and the, uh, you know it's like maybe not because like when you were saying the thing about the marijuana laws it's like okay you have a different law for each drug okay that's too complex so we're going to make a law that has to do with this concept of intoxication okay now if in fact intoxication is related to a human biological phenomena that is in common to all these things then you've made the right move and it'll work but let's say you went in another direction and you said it's you get you got you got something from the bible you know that that was some fundamental principle that tied it all together but it's actually not it's actually this fake thing created by people and it doesn't relate to real fundamental causative things but you can't tell the can you tell the difference based on just the 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 the, the kinds of mm -hmm you know both of them are these simple models and you create a you create a new a set of laws that's more simple using this biblical principle i'm trying to think of what it would be you know if something is pure let's, let's say it's, it's based on the something around the idea of purity or something um how can you tell the difference i mean i think that the, yeah. you can one way to tell the difference is that one will work better than the other because it's based on real principles, but when you first come up with the idea, is there a way to tell? Um, there, I'm sure there's ways to tell better. You know, is there an absolute distinction that could be applied in advance that doesn't require you to experimentally verify it down the road? I don't know, that's doubtful. I mean, from an individual point of view, I ran it through the filters of the things we've already been talking about. And I thought on the one hand, uh, there, 
there are more kinds of subfunctions involved in one than the other, right? For example, uh, a rule that takes people's feelings into account, a rule which takes the, asks itself what was the purpose of the rule in the first place, um, right? So there's if you start drawing on different qualitative domains, you get a much more colorful simplification. Uh, and then there may even be a way to chart that. I mean, there could be an algorithmic difference depending on how things are defined initially. Um, I think there's something about everything being treated generically, being treated kind of flatly as if it was all the same versus the feeling that the simplification comes from a number of qualitatively distinct domains. So that's on the one side. The other side is, uh, who is the one who makes the abstraction, right? So that if we're thinking about um, a, a relatively superficial conscious mind and a relatively more authentic organic mind or, or some version of that, then the abstraction has to come out of a process that goes into the active unconscious intelligence. Otherwise, it comes out of the um, overly simplified in the sense of lacking detail conscious mind. So yeah. there may be ways to tell that it did come out of the active unconscious intelligence. There's almost certainly ways to tell that the information went in or not. Uh, certainly I think we know as individuals or if we attend to it, we start to find there are patterns of when we grab something and hold it in the foyer or where we let it go into the main house where we can't quite see it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think part of the answer here related to what you said is that the move towards the unconscious, it, it, we're saying is related to the move towards the true um, source code kinds of principles. And the other move is using the symbolic conscious mind. And um, yeah, it's like the unconscious is tuned and capable of thinking of very complex things. That's what it does. It's like it takes in a shitload of input. Yeah. And it just comes up with an answer. And it's like, it fe the answer feels right. It's the intuition. It's just like, that's what it came up with. We don't know how. It's like a neural network. You don't know what's going on. Whereas the symbolic conscious mind takes things in and then it creates these categories and it comes up with an answer, which you, and you can trace the logic. So mm. it's, it's got logic attached to it, which has pros and cons. Um, but it's a different thing. And so one is kind of like, the, so there, I think there are practices, you know, speaking of practices, there are practices of um, letting go of the conscious mind and allowing, you know, like the you, you practice, getting to the bottom of the you and coming back out is one such practice where you, um, you let go of the discursive mind and you allow things to come out um, after you've sort of like immersed yourself in the information, then you say, okay, I'm going to sleep on it or I'm going to chill through it and just see what pops into my head from the silence. Um, that's, that's a really good example of a partnership between the two minds. Yes. That's very much what uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is concerned with. And it seems to me that if you do think of an active unconscious agent who is the primary one evolving through stages, for example, or gaining intelligence of some kind, then it's going to be at some place along a spectrum of capacity. So that when we let go, um, we don't necessarily know what we're letting go into, right? One person might have a relatively unsophisticated unconscious in the sense that. They just have the instincts they inherited from the last hundred million years. 
which yeah. tell them nothing about airplanes or or politics or whatever. Right. And then the next person may have been able to get 10% of what they know through to that other system so that it can decide. And the next person might have gotten 80% through. Yeah. And uh, one of the peculiar things about it seems to be like one way to parse them apart is you got a system, say complexity is doesn't need to be created. It's already the case for most patterns go to indefinite complexity in the cosmos. So yeah. how do we deal with that? Well, you got one system that can recognize complexity and it can get better at recognizing complexities. And you got another system that utilizes complexities. Um, and one could be much superior to the other, right? So you have a mind that you could have the highly developed but superficial integral thinker. They can recognize an enormous number of patterns from out of the complexities. They might not be able to do anything properly. Conversely, you might have a mind where there's been an enormous amount of subconscious development or whatever you want to call it, a person who can utilize complexities enormously well in what they do, but they don't actually know much about it. In fact, most of their statements are objectively false. <laughs> they seem insane. Yeah. Right? The, the spiritual world is full of these people. You, you can't believe the nonsense they say. But when you watch their moves, their moves are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So, I mean, ideally, you can get both. But it seems to be two different ways of handling complexity. So what, I mean, the, I was talking to Bruce about this yesterday. I mean, my fantasy is... You know, you write a book. What are the techniques that cultivate subconscious intelligence? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, some of them we know, but it seems to be a largely uncharted approach, at least in terms of overtly discussing it. Yeah, I, um, I guess so. I mean, I would say off the top of my head that... You know, there's this process of of anything that's sort of socially learned, which which I think is, you know, 95% of what we know. I mean, like even riding a bicycle, somebody shows you how. Mm -hmm. um, it starts out in the symbolic mind. Someone says, here's a handlebar. This is left. This is right. You lean left, you lean right. right. And so it, you've got all these concepts and you're learning it and you're, it's in, you're in system, you're in system two, the comments sense and then at some point boom you're riding the bicycle and then a little while later you forget you forget what you're doing and you can't describe it to anybody and it's gone entirely into the unconscious um if you become a bicycle teacher then you have to resurrect and reconstruct that unconscious back into the conscious which is yet a further move but um i think that everything that's in that system one symbolic world if we practice it and put it to use and to work in real situations does get assimilated into the unconscious i think that's always what happens and it's maybe not that uh mysterious um perhaps um you know, like there's so much in the theoretic in the world of theory and models that isn't really tried, fleshed out, practiced deeply. So um, it must be, we must succeed at least at a low level on a regular basis. I think even the fact if we think of that other intelligence as uh, um giving us authenticity and motivation and a sense of being, then people pull it off, in, at least in small degrees, fairly regularly. We must have a pre some pretty good basic approaches, like you say about the bicycle. You know, yeah. and even that, um, it may be that the person tries to reconstruct consciously the process and they don't really reconstruct it. They actually end up saying to the next person, uh, the things that were said to them while they were trying to learn it in the first place. Yeah. And those things were never the actual instructions. It's just what you say while the person's undergoing the process. Yeah. You don't become a very good teacher if that's what you're, what you're doing, but yeah. yeah. 
yeah, I mean, yeah. A good teach, a good teacher is trying to articulate the, their deep knowledge. Yeah, and put it into words. Yeah. Um, there's a number of. I mean, it's interesting in terms of what we were talking about earlier, in terms of mapping nature's complexity. Uh, when I think of the subconscious, on the one hand, it's a system that I would like to have contain a more faithful, a richer model of ontological complexity so that it can work with that. On the other hand, from the point of view of the conscious model making mind, the unconscious is like nature, and the conscious mind needs a better model of its processes so that they can interface more naturalistically. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, and one of the puzzles, uh, maybe Kahneman's book um, answers this better than I can remember or know, but I think one of the puzzles is if you really start looking at what the conscious mind does, more and more of it you realize is unconscious until until you really start wondering like what is the conscious mind doing at all if everything you know anything you think the conscious mind is doing you when you step back and say did i intend I where was it that i decided to make that cognitive move yeah. and it's like oh well the unconscious did that <laughs> um so in this question of how they interact and what it means for the conscious to understand the unconscious. I mean, it's probably, and you know, in part it is, you know, I think it's all very related to the symbolic function again, the, the categorizing. It's like, um, you know, the, the unconscious, you know, you, you start with right and left, or you just take some theory. You know, let's just take like integral theory and we talk about subjective and objective. And so we, people, have uh can talk about interiors and exteriors and apply those concepts but um it's not until you start to apply it and make decisions based on it that something comes into your it works into your unconscious and then the categories aren't it, it doesn't work in categories anymore they, they're allowed to be fluid and not have clear bound clear language like boundaries um it's a different a different logic in there um it can deal with things that are in between interior and exterior and it's not a problem um but as soon as it you bring it back out to the conscious you, you there's this you know i call it an epi epistemic drive to try to get these clean categories going so you can make meaning of it it's interesting with um the idea of integral level or second tier kind of thinking that the possibility seems to be hanging like fruit from the apple tree that most of those things are nameable right like in your description you say well there's some kind of fluid boundary in betweenness between the subjective and the objective now you've just consciously and verbally articulated that in a way that's very satisfying because then then the experience comes up consciousness is like hey yep i already nailed that one <laughs> yeah so there's yeah. this possibility of an increasing and in a way quicker uh, mutual confirmation between these approaches yeah yeah it's one way that I sort of des describe um, development, especially, you know, usually we mean like ego development or Keegan's meaning making development. We talk about development and we have this idea that the cognitive line leads somehow. Um, and the way I interpret that is the cognitive line is the ability to understand increasingly complex patterns. So at pluralist and second tier, you can understand um, non-linearities and inter interpenetrations and ecosystems. And you have a, like a felt sense of when you run into one of these things. Um, so that's, that's part of developing that capacity. But you, you take that cognitive capacity to understand that level of complexity and you turn it 
towards yourself to understand the self and others, the, that whole world of interiors. And you don't actually develop um, in this meaning making or ego development line, which includes spiritual intelligence and all that, a lot of other social emotional kinds of stuff. You don't actually develop along that line until you, you turn that lens around and take that complexity capacity that you've developed and turn it inward. And I think when you do that at each level, you, you can plumb a deeper level of the self system. So like what you're talking about at that, you know, second tier or whatever is the achievement of taking a kind of cognitive complexity where you understand, you, you can understand more of the way the unconscious, you can understand more of the complexity of the unconscious, basically. Because you've developed a cognitive tool to do that and then you turn it inward and you start understanding yourself and that's where the development happens. Um, again, it's like, it's not, it's not necessarily in terms of words and categories and models. It's just like this felt sense of like, oh, I can now get this kind of complexity where I can feel 10 or 20 things moving around in juxtaposition with each other and, and grok it somehow, move with it, flow with it. That's interesting to me because I use uh, I tend to use this two axis model where I put altitude across the bottom as if it's horizontal and put an additional factor I call amplitude going up the side which makes it seem like this is the first tier and this is the second tier rather than building sequentially they're kind of orthogonal so if you have a, um, a yeah, cognitive yeah. complexity achievement at a particular level let's say pluralistic You've got that here, but going up this way means ex extending its application to other dimensions because this exactly. is it's like this is the complexification and this is the integration, which means you're yes. gonna, in a way, it's complexity and simplicity going like this. And you're going to spike with integration each time you achieve a level, but they are relatively independent, and you're going to get. Um, uh, there's many, it seems to me there's multiple ways to make that orthogonal move, right? That one person could ex extend or expand a set of insights to these five other aspects of things. And someone else could extend and expand it to some additional five aspects. And they might be, you, know, you might grade them the same, even though yeah. there's a significant qualitative divergence but they would both have an intensification of the overall feeling of being and of the overall experiential applicability of the insights they've gained in their cognitive complexity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of separating that out into two parts in my head this, in this moment. One is, you know, let's say you're at um, third person perspective and you're, you're moving into pluralistic fourth person perspective. So, from third person perspective, you understand, so you can grok certain kinds of complexity in the world, certain patterns of complexity. Now, fourth person perspective might just mean anything that's more complicated than third person. So there might be several ways, several pattern matching kinds of capacities that you could develop and we would call them all fourth person because they, they transcend and include third person and they can reflect back on third person and understand it and do more, but they're different. They're, what they have in common is just that they're more than third. So that's part one, is that there's diff different kinds of complexity patterns that you might be able to cognitively understand, a, sort of a family of them. The second part is the move of taking that complexity capacity and turning it inward to understand the self. And I, I think that's the main move, it, it, it is that there's the exterior world you know, cognitive complexity is about understanding it. And the meaning making complexity is understanding me, mine, yours, theirs, ours, the interior and in the, in the, in the so, social part. So when you turn that lens inward, there's also a whole world of things that you can begin to understand. 
So that's another place that people will diverge is that which of the vast realm of the unconscious and, and the social emotional world do you apply this new complexity tool to? And, and that is a move of, of depth. The, the almost, it's almost like the complexity, it's kind of almost like a height thing a little bit, cognitive complexity, but you, you go up and down, you stretch down, um, you can understand more of the world, but you understand more deeper inside the self. So it's 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 a kind of like yeah. It's a, it's there's a, there's a Nietzsche quote about that. How does it go? It's, the tree can yeah. only grow as high as the roots grow deep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's <laughs> your that's your aptitude. It seems like that's your aptitude axis. It's like the depths. Dimension. Yeah, I think so, and it it does have a fluctuation to it. I think. Um, it's interesting because it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to really be sure what the most primitive and general example of the developments are, right? The the Keegan kind of model is very plausible. Uh, and what you're saying about having the insights about the world and then turning them into yourself echoes the, right? I've got this objective thing and that's the first step. And then I'm going to objectify my subject, which is the real fulfillment of that move. Yeah. Um, yeah. However. It doesn't seem to be totally out of the question that it could happen the other way, right? That a person could, by some bizarre other trajectory, end up having it for the self or end up having it in a wee space, and then their growth would be to apply it to an additional space. As if we think of out there as being uh, one of the subjective subfunctions, right? Because it's my perception of out there is what I'm dealing with. It's, yeah. it's, it's my. Um, cognitive perceptual world modeling that's one of my systems and then i'm going to link that to another one or two or three of my systems and then the most general statement i can make about that is that i'm interlinking my systems and trying to get them in parity somehow now it may be that it mostly starts on one of the systems it's easier for us to start that way under the given conditions uh, but it also seems to me that it's a more generalized position to say you could hypothetically come in from any angle and pull off the same move. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I'm kind of betting on a on a particular direction right now, partly because um, it 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 coincides with uh, O'Fallon's stages model that I use, and partly because um, I've been able to find some cognitive science that 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 um backs it up but i mean the idea is like the idea is that the exterior comes first um and i'm not certain of it but it's kind of where, where i'm definitely leaning and so one example is like um the child learns the concept of prejudice okay it would seem like in all cases the first move is they would learn it as something they point to. Oh, that person's prejudiced. Oh, okay. That person's prejudiced. Oh, okay. And it's only much later that they that they say, "Am I prejudiced?" Or, "Holy shit, I'm being prejudiced." You know. And so, yeah, in that sense, um, it's hard to imagine the the order being reversed there. So maybe I'm cherry picking my examples um to fit um the model but that's kind of where i'm that's where i'm leaning the with the exterior coming right. yeah people, and I, I point to things outside you know partly because they're they're more concrete you can point to them and they're they're also in the inner subjective field so you're uh maybe that's the difference things that are learned through cultural mechanisms have to be exteriors and you know, there may be things you learn through like contemplative practices that no one's ever spoken about and in that case um and you don't even have language for it. so maybe in that case the interior comes first but it that maybe that's why it's such a rarer thing yeah insofar as a developmental trajectory involves um being scaffolded from the outside by some kind of sociologically assisted pattern, yeah. Um, then that's got to come from the outside. Um, 
However, I mean, there may be less common roots around that. Um, they just wouldn't be as common. And obviously, um, things that are easier to see are going to be used more, all things being equal. Yeah. H however, there are, uh, I'm sure you could probably find examples of patterns running in almost any direction. You know, you're like, yes, uh, I see something outside for a while before I notice it also applies to me. However, therapeutically, you know, you have somebody who's uh, constantly apologizing in a relationship. They feel like they're always being the asshole. And then one day they realize actually their spouse is the asshole. And this is a very empowering moment, right? So yeah. it might be that they start off internalizing it and then realize it's got to be put outside. So I think those, it, it's extremely complex, the number of possible routes from one domain of an individual's perception to another domain of an individual's perception. Uh, however, all things being equal, I think things that are easier to see are, are where they're going to start. And like we were just saying, anything sociologically scaffolded is going to come in from the outside. Yeah. And, and another sequence is I think that, I mean, you understand, you tend to understand concrete things before subtle or abstract or interior things because the senses, physical senses come first in the concrete world. Um, and I think we tend to understand um, subtle patterns. Um, within between people and, and in, within between objects after, even after that. So um, if you're taking something like the concept of being an asshole, um, maybe it would go first, it's exterior, someone's pointing around and that's an asshole. And then, yeah. and then you learn that and, you're, and then you learn it because you know, you know, when you're a child, you didn't even know what the word meant to be a jerk. And then, and then you sort of internalize it because your parents started calling you a jerk and you say, oh, I'm a jerk, I'm a jerk. And then, and then at some point, you start to realize that other people are, it's not you. That, but, but that move is actually more complex because you're realizing that there's something in the, in the reciprocal relationship that's created between the two people so that it's not your fault anymore. It's part of the system. So that's actually a further move. It's not going backwards. So, no, I don't know. It, yeah, it's I, forward I would backwards say, is a bit tricky there. Um, I think you can track, in, in most cases, you can find an example that tracks from any particular domain you look at to some other domain. Now, where it was before it was in the first domain is going to get a little sketchy. And one of the interesting things is we just don't know how much is inherited with the unit. Right. For example, the asshole, whatever that is. Right. Conceptually, that's got to be um, interpreted by the society in order to get the word. But that doesn't mean that the felt experience of it isn't based on an instinct that everybody in every human culture has come built in with and was right. called and conceptualized very differently in different cultures. Right. But some other culture might have called it the natural attitude of the nobility. But it might have had exactly the same valence. Yeah. <laughs> yes. To me, that connects spirituality with development because that's uh, all of these, no matter which domain you start in, when you find its echo in the other domain is when you have the opportunity for uh, that overtone resonance effect. You can produce a little bit of the extra quality that's associated with coherence between what seems to you to be a couple different domains. So yeah, I'm interested just, because I think of it mostly as spirituality, but uh, it can be unpacked towards healing or unpacked towards developmental growth pretty directly. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, you're bringing it back to your model. I was just thinking of how I, I was just bringing it back to my model in my mind. So this is a good, this is a good you know, like we're, we're working towards uh, maybe some, some completion here. 
Um, I have to chew more on this because because a lot of what I'm framing in terms of the the complexity simplicity dynamic um, you are seeing in terms of this um, this resonance and, and excess model. So it's it's an yeah that they're yeah. great metaphors to bounce off each other. But what I was Something fundamental to my model is the the discoveries by the neo Piagetians, you know, Commons in particular, and I think Fisher is quite aligned with this. Who boils development down? Um, I think he probably reduces it too much, but it's essentially a mathematical formula. Um, but the idea is that any time something builds upon something else it it um, coordinates or abstracts or operates upon something at a lower level that's building complexity and 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 you can according to this model and I believe it you can usually or perhaps always there's, there's no ambiguity in this kind of model where you know um, you know you learn to you learn to catch and you learn to throw and you learn to run and then you build playing baseball. There's, there's a, there's a def definitive hierarchical relation there that one transcends and includes the others and builds upon or coordinates other things. And it's just that simple move which creates the process of develop, the developmental move. And it is, there, there isn't any ambiguity in terms of like which direction are we going. So. Um, and then I think there is more ambiguity in the, in the simplicity direction of reducing complexity. I think you're, you're problematizing that direction as, as it, it being not as, uh, simply explained, but I, yeah, I, I'm kind of I tend to be convinced by Commons and Fisher's models that there's in a lot of these things there's a definite directionality if you look at something and really analyze it closely it's like what does one thing build upon the other or you know but but like you know but you keep bringing up examples where two things that are kind of floating off in different spaces they come together and they create a, an excess they create a, a new whole and it's not that either one but the new whole does build upon the others. So that again is the move. Um, yeah. yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think you need, uh, in order to achieve the new whole, you need some kind of uh, operational equivalence between the parts from the prior level, right? To, to establish a new whole on the junior whole lots don't have to just exist. They have to exist with a particular kind of parity so that they can get in on the same project to some degree. So from, right. a, from their experiential point of view, they have a, a mutuality, a harmony. There's some kind of uh, equality among them in that move because they're gonna come together uh, in almost an egalitarian sense to be part of the next thing. Right. So it they're, depends which bit of the process you're focusing on. Yeah, I think you could say they are they are of a realm of reality such that they can participate with each other in some way. Yeah. So like um like uh running and catching and throwing can participate with each other whereas running and um doing square roots or multiplication cannot they're in yeah. different such different realms, they they can't easily participate with each other. So they won't. You it's won't build it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's harder to get it. Maybe it's more rewarding to get it. It's uncertain, right? Maybe right. you get more of it when you make that connection. When you've got, uh, you know, when Einstein is playing baseball, maybe there's this yeah. moment whose experiential intensity far exceeds the experiential intensity of of the component skills that come together in riding a bike. Yeah. But the, the thing that, uh, two things that uh, aren't in that very straightforward, extremely plausible and useful buildup of modules that can reflect on each other and organize sub skills into higher skills, tremendously useful. 
but doesn't have on the one hand the idea of multiple qualitative domains of that process operating beside each other and coming together right. at certain points. Right. Also doesn't focus on uh, peak experience points within that process. What it's like to catch that ball that time is not just the enactment of the baseball operating system. It's also an existential epiphany that justifies your total sense of being across all your levels. Uh, so for me, it's important to have those two factors wound in, even though I'm also very, you know, convinced by the neo pagetian description. Yeah. yeah, anytime that you, you talk about uh, whole lines and transcending and including, you, you, the mind wants to think like, oh, things are coming together. But actually, there's a thing that comes together in this world where many other things are coming together at the same level. So there's always going to be, you know, like species, um, the evolution of species. They don't all come together into all, all animals looking more and more of the same. Um, so, yeah. Or all ideas, as ideas and memes evolve, they don't look more and more the same. No, and that gets to, I mean, to me, that's a, a different discussion, a, a more quasi-metaphysical discussion. You know, when I make my little two-axis charts, the, the, the optimum, the farthest point of convergence, I, you know, put a little omega or a little question mark, exclamation mark or something there. But for me, that point, the telos, is inherently convergent, divergent. It can't be described without having both qualities. And as the telos, it's present within each of the steps. Like every time you pull off an integration, every time a holon emerges, it, it partakes of the general character of the actual and or virtual telos, which is simultaneously divergent and convergent. It can never pull off the convergence without also being divergent. So you're never gonna get, it doesn't funnel, funnel, funnel toward an ultimate point. Um, it funnels releases at each of the steps. Maybe the total amount of diversity remains constant throughout the process, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think it can come together without also increasing the, the spread. Yeah, maybe a way to look at it is to say that within a within a, a vast ecosystem, certain things will come together and create new holes, and those holes will be quite unique. Yeah. And yet, somewhere over here, there's another unique hole being created it, within this whole field of an ecology. All, a lot when you, if you notice something is creating a new hole on. Um, great your focus is on the whole but there's other holes that are equally happening and what what doesn't happen what 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 i'm i would want to propose is what doesn't happen is that the whole field creates some huge hole that's 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 the um that's the omega point move and um that I think if you make that move in the way of abstraction as we were talking about I think you're you're, I think it's it's likely to be mental masturbation, or you're, it's like that epistemic drive that wants everything to come together into that big yeah. hole. But what? But if you're, if what comes together as a whole is that you've realized that there's an underlying source code or or causal principle, then maybe yes, you have, you know, there is a hole at that level. But it, but then again, that hole was always there. And you just realized it. So again, it's not like it actually, um, yeah. But you know, then, uh, then again, we think of like the big emergence moves, like when matter created life and life created consciousness. Um, there perhaps is a sense that the whole field actually 
transcended and included. So um, that's kind of a counter argument to what I was just saying. Yeah, I. Well, it's it's not true. It's not true actually, because only certain only certain matter became life, and there could be other kinds of life, yeah. and only certain life became con conscious, and there's other kinds of conscious. So I don't know. Greater depth, less span. But like yeah. so this, right, there's right, right, a, right. a combination of uh, increasing inclusivity and something like specialization. Uh, for me, this is. Uh, related somehow to the concept of personalization of uh one of the flaws in the over generalized and overly abstract approach to spirituality in the past was the tendency of some systems to conceive it as a move toward the impersonal away from the personal as opposed to looking at very similar methodological practices moving towards a hyper personal condition and so you get an interplay of both of those you get the saints who are trying to wipe away their individual characteristics and then you periodically have these saints who look increasingly idiosyncratic um i i connect even to just as a bit of a tangent language you know when i was a kid i read a lot of science fiction and i had this overwhelming sense that there was going to be a universal human language whether it was going to be Esperanto or, or mutated English, I didn't know, but I was sure it was coming. And now I see Google Translate, and I realize I was completely wrong. The ability of everybody to get along without learning anybody else's language is increasing dramatically. So then what does, what does the future of language look like if it doesn't look like everybody's speaking the same language in terms of language content? And so I, I open that space up for myself and I end up imagining a picture in which people who go deeper in a more peculiar way into their own language end up having more in common with other people who've done the same thing in their language. Even though yeah. they don't necessarily know the same words, a person who's mutated their own English has something in common with a person who's mutated their own French. So there's a convergence a similarity that's emerging among these people, but it's it's also an increased idiosyncrasy, a peculiarity. It doesn't look like a shared generic set of content. Hmm. Uh, there's something in that where you could, uh, you go forward, it's larger in a way, but it's also like you're going deeper, deeper into the pieces. So you don't necessarily see the all over field effect even though omega point descriptions could be valid if they're treated as idiosyncratic and holographically distributed into the points where they do go forward rather than as applying just generically to the whole system yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> That I, checks out. <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah. My, my, my brain's starting to run out of steam at this point. <laughs> yeah, well, we must be coming just about to the end. Uh, I know I had a dozen yeah. more questions about complexity and simplicity, but we don't have to get to all of them tonight. <laughs> we could have another one. Um, yeah. Let's just end by saying, why is any of this important? Of course, that could launch another 45 minute conversation, but I'm wondering if there's something that uh, ties it up. Why is it important to you? Different sets of answers. I mean, one answer is it's just an excuse for me to hang out with you for a while, which I like. Yeah. Another one is uh, I feel empowered when I'm fumbling toward the front edge of my thinking. I feel like I get organized um, with subtle ambiguities. This is a delightful process for me to try to feel out where where my thought's going to go next. And I can only tell where it's going to go by finding little puzzles 
that are ultra peculiar because if they were more familiar puzzles, they would already have been solved and they wouldn't be my puzzles. Mm. So there's that, and I think that that's a good thing for other people to see. If anybody ends up watching this video, that uh, the integral community, the meta modern community, whatever this is, doesn't consist of people who have fully formed philosophies they just want to lay on other people. It consists of uh, pondering together into the frontier of vision logic space. And mm -hmm. the more people who do things like this, the more integral civilization there is. Whereas mm -hmm. the more people who just tell each other what integral is, that doesn't necessarily get you to integral culture. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the, on the specific topic of complexity, simplicity, addition, ablation, um, I think there is, there is something to be solved there. If it is the case, that um, release is a instructional, relatable, but essentially poetic way of describing a version of the additive complexification process. That's something we would like to know in order to move ahead in a post-metaphysical and science-friendly way to make more actual discoveries about that process that can be verified. Now, it may not turn out to be that way, but there's a legitimacy to that inquiry because we want to know how it works because it's the most important thing for everybody and so it should work better yeah yeah i agree <laughs> yeah and how about you <laughs> um Well, kind of following what you said, um, um, I always appreciate the way that your mind works and the and the it it, it generates surprises for me. So um, surprises that are uh, almost understandable, so that I'm drawn to that. <laughs> it's like this. I'm almost you know. There's something there. So. Um, so uh always enjoy connecting um in terms of the topic um i guess i would just say you know you propose that we talk about a model that i'm working on so that's kind of how it started and the model is um i i think um the question of what it means to develop and evolve and deepen spiritually is um, the critical question for us in the meta-modern time, if one defines spirituality in a certain way. And um, yeah, I think that, and that uh, especially as, you know, meaning, both meaning making and sense of purpose and sense of connection and intimacy are at the same time fragmenting and going crazy but also deepening and sweetening mm. so um and i think we need more t concepts and vocabularies and models to help us understand what's going on and that part of that is, you know, what I perceive as this kind of conflation or confusion in this territory of when in the spiritual, in the conversation of spiritual growth, spiritual depth, or developmental growth, wisdom growth, um, some, when are we making things more complex and when are we making things more simple? When do we need each? Is I think um, just, has occurred to me in the last few years as a pivotal question that people aren't asking. Um, yeah. There are a lot of people on either side of the equation, you know, all you need is love, you know, back to the earth. It's simple, 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 but then you end up with dumb solutions. 
And then there are other people that love their complexity and their abstraction, and they're not going in the right direction either. And it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, it's some kind of dance between the two. And it's not as, it's not as, it's not just simply oh, find the right balance. There are, there are very specific kinds of relationships between simplicity and connect, connect, complexity that we can flesh out and use. So that's what motivates me to work on this and. Since you're offering to help me think about it, um, bound to be fun. Yeah, even, Probably bound to be very long conversation. Also, <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm uh, oriented to problematize the distinction, uh, I think it's an exquisitely useful distinction to move forward with.